Ladies and gentlemen, live from the Canadian Broadcast Centre, this is CBC Connects. <laughs> CBC Connects. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jamie Ordolis. Uh, today we're very excited for a special edition of CBC Connects dedicated to courageous reporting and we're very lucky to have some of CBC News's courageous journalists here with us today to talk about what it's really like to take risks in the field to bring us the stories that matter from here and from around the world. I want you to be part of this conversation. We really want you, whether you're on Twitter at CBC, hashtag CBC Connects, or in the audience. So I'm gonna get out in there with you and we're gonna prepare for our Q&A section. I'll be right over there. Leading today's panel is CBC Radio's Carol Off. She's the host of As It Happens, and she's also the chair of Canadian Journalists for Free Expression. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Carol Off. Thank you, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. As you can see, there are a lot of bells and whistles behind me and all around me, but the news gathering teams, some of whom are here, who go out in the field are working with very bare bones technology. The reporters are armed with their wits, their curiosity, and a lot of kit that they're schlepping everywhere they go. It's a very tough job, as you're going to hear, but CBC News teams, which often include a camera person, sometimes, well, in the olden days, a sound person, they are there with a lot of backup that they have to work with. They have, they have support from special training they get for hostile environments. They have support back home, financial, logistical. They have embassies we can turn to in the field. And we have a very sweet document called the Canadian Passport, so we can get out when times are bad. We are honoring courageous reporting here because tonight Canadian journalists for free expression will give special awards to brave men and women abroad, our colleagues who don't have any of that support. In fact, their own governments and police are trying to shut them down. Uh, they've been arrested, tortured, and sometimes killed. 87 journalists and media gatherers have died just this year doing their jobs. And you're going to hear about some of the challenges our own reporters face, but they're also going to tell you about some of the things that they have seen that our colleagues in the field, in those countries where they don't uh, have a passport to have them leave, in fact, are struggling every day. Are, uh, they're going to tell you a bit about that and about their own jobs. I'm going to tell you each person, I'm going to get them to come to the stage. We're going to start with David Common. He's worked as a CBC News correspondent, reporting from more than 50 countries, bringing us stories like the 2003 invasion of Iraq and the earthquake in Haiti. He's covered Afghanistan and the tsunami in Japan. His latest assignment, I'm sure you heard him on World Report, covering the disaster in the Philippines. He is CBC Radio 1's World Report voice host. Please welcome David Common. This is when I move over here. See how I follow instructions. Anna Maria Tremonti is a seasoned journalist, host of the, was once a host of the Fifth Estate. You know her from The Current. She has been a foreign correspondent in a number of postings, Berlin, Bosnia, London, Jerusalem, and Washington. And she is the host of The Current on CBC Radio. Please welcome Anna Maria Tremonti. realize this, but it's often very difficult to get the story here in Canada. You don't have to go abroad to run into trouble. John Lancaster works behind the scenes doing investigative journalism, putting him face to face with a rather dark side of the crime in this country. 
although I don't know if John expected to cover the dark side of City Hall, and I'm hoping he's going to tell us a bit about that. Please welcome to the stage network reporter John Lancaster. Excuse me. She's won several Gemini Awards for her work covering conflict and disaster all over the globe. She was based in Jerusalem, covered the Middle East for three and a half years. She's also spent time as CBC's correspondent in London. If there's a crisis, she goes. Indonesia to Afghanistan. Please welcome Adrian Arsenal. We can sit. <laughs> yes, yes, we couldn't sit before you were here. Or Afghanistan, but that, you know, that's well, okay. you know, I think I was supposed to change that before I came that's up okay. here, but you know, this is what happens. You see, we're doing things on the fly. Can you all pick up your mics and make sure that we have contact? Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. It's me. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, now we're going to do a short talk. I'm going to ask them some, some questions and then we'll get some questions from you folks later. There's a couple more guests, as you can see, we're still going to surprise you with. I want to start asking, with, uh, asking questions with David Common because you have seen a lot of things happen to people. You've seen the risks they take. You've actually seen, in particular, the people you've worked with. Can you tell us who are the people who help you do these stories when you're in the field? Uh, we we've all at this table faced some level of risk in our job and sometimes that means near death stuff but those who face the greatest risk that work among us are almost always our fixers those people who we work with who are locals to that country be it someone in afghanistan or the philippines or haiti uh, egypt whatnot they are people who know the scene and can help get us to the story who know people um, we have the luxury of leaving at the end of all, all of this, and we have the luxury of knowing that there's a big company and a powerful first world country behind us if trouble were to strike. They don't have that luxury. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's one case in particular of a fixer from Afghanistan who, um, in the aftermath of a kidnapping of our correspondent there, um, he got thrown into a jail. You're talking, you're talking about Melissa Fung. About Melissa Fung. And um, Melissa went through a terrible experience herself. And uh, the experience that our fixer went through meant that he was grabbed. They needed to blame someone. They threw him in a very bad jail, uh, the kind of prison you don't want to go to, the kind of prison you hear about only in some weird, sick movie. Uh, and he was there for more than two months and managed to get out, didn't escape. He was released. He was not guilty of anything. Uh, but these are the repercussions, and, and since that time, you know, difficulty for his family, difficulty for his brother who was arrested with him. These are the folks who face the greatest challenge that we work with, I think. Um, Anna Maria, I know you have met many people in the field. You have worked with some of the best people abroad and seen the kind of courage they have to show. Can you talk a bit about what you have encountered in the field? Well, I think when we talk about courageous reporting, um, in a very simple way, courageous reporting is asking the questions that they don't want you to ask, meaning governments, meaning officials, meaning sometimes other journalists who see it the way a government sees it. Um, and that gets more courageous uh, depending on how oppressive the surroundings are. Um, and so in order to do create courageous reporting, it's really about going and documenting and detailing through the picture, through the sound, through the details. Um, but sometimes it's not going very far. And we work with people for whom, as David says, we leave. Uh, for whom uh, they have all, they, not only do they not leave, they cannot leave. And so whatever they do, and whatever they do as their own journalism or journalism with you, um, they can be held accountable for it by people who would prefer that they never ask that question. And that's where it becomes really courageous, the simple asking of the question, can we see it, why'd you do it? Um, I'm just going to skip John just for a moment because there's a lot I want to ask you about reporting in Canada because I just want to continue on the foreign theme. And Adrian, what to you represents courage? What have you seen that represents courage in the field? Uh, wow, courage in the field. I think we, we've all been having this conversation. That's not a word any of us would ever ascribe to any of us. 
uh, and, and it's, it's not a word that I think, you know, any working journalist who, as David said, have the benefit of someone who hopefully will come for you if something goes south, um, you know, use that word. Because things happen in the field in a flash, you know, they, and so there are moments where you have to suck it up. And I think there are moments when, you know, at the end of the night where you think, ooh, we got away with that. But overwhelmingly, the phenomenon is, as Anna Marie explained, that you're dealing with people who have to stay. And we all have to make choices sometimes that we would like to push a little bit more to go down a road a little bit further or push a little bit harder to get a picture. But we happen to be working with someone who has to live there, who we know after we zoom off on the plane will probably get picked up. And so it, there's a lot of restraint involved in what we do because you have to pay attention, obviously, to the needs of the people who are left behind, which are acute and, and real. And our biggest problem in the field often is that this fear that we become a burden on the people we've either come to report or come to work with. The last thing we need is, is to create more problems from them. And that's sort of endemic in what we do. Uh, now, you've all mentioned that one, and I mentioned it as well at the beginning, that the advantage we have, no matter what we've encountered, we can leave. We don't have to stay. We, if it gets dicey, we're out. John Lancaster cannot. <laughs> and uh, John, you have, I, and I think what you do is very courageous. You have to go after people that you may run into in the supermarket the next day, or even worse, your family might be intimidated by. And I know some of those things have happened to you. T tell us a bit about what risks you take actually going after bad people, some of them are in power, bad people here in Canada. Uh, well, first of all, I, I would never consider myself courageous. I, I consider myself very fortunate to be doing a job I love. Um, yes, I've been in some dicey situations uh, he here in Canada, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, some Caribbean countries I've been sent to. Um, I would say we're exceptionally fortunate here in Canada. H having said that, times have changed a little bit. When I first started in the 90s, uh, a TV camera was almost a uh, safe passage uh, to get into some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in this country or to approach people. I think that's changed, and um, I think cameras are now seen uh, increasingly as invasive, uh, or potentially more powerful with the advent of social media. I mean, I think we all know in this city what the power of a cell phone has done to, to one individual, uh, you know, our mayor. So I think, uh, you know, again, I, I can't s stress enough, uh, I don't consider myself courageous, but there are issues uh, when you are digging, and we are like dogs sometimes, fetching a bone, we just don't want to give up, we want to go deeper than anyone else can. And you come across uh, situations, uh, I've had a pit bull set on me, uh, I've taken a pretty good beating once, uh, people coming to my home to threaten me, uh, damaging my home, all trying to send you a message. But again, none of that, uh, it all pales in comparison to some of the places my colleagues, and certainly journalists in foreign countries who have been murdered, their families kidnapped, so, uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I think that's the message I'd like to get, I'd like to get across today. Um, so you don't want to, none of you wants to say you're courageous. I think you are, and I think you're also extremely talented. One of the things that you are very, very talented at doing, and I want you to speak to this, is when you go to do stories, especially abroad, we are sent to some very strange places, you have to tell a story that makes Canadians care and care about places and people they've never met, that are, look strange, are in strange environments. And, but it's key to finding a way to make someone connect with the story of Eritrea or the story of, of Indonesia, where, our, uh, where uh, Adrian's never been. Uh, the stories of countries where, you know, people aren't speaking English, but they are telling you, they're trusting you. As Adrian just said, they're trusting you with their lives often when they tell these stories, and you have to do justice to it. David, if you just want to speak about what it takes to try and connect the worlds you've been with the people you're reporting to here in Canada. You know, I often, on this subject, like to think about Haiti, because it's faster to fly from where we are in Toronto to Haiti than it is from here to Vancouver, much faster. Um, and yet we don't think of it as as close as it actually is. We don't often think of ourselves as Canadians as having uh, the links that we do have. There are a lot of links and a lot of Haitian Canadians. Um, I think that that's one thing that connects, but often I think it's just through storytelling that 
in many ways, we aren't all that different as human beings from other human beings on the planet. And um, while we have different concerns and different worries, we can certainly empathize with what is happening to some people, be it in the aftermath of an earthquake, having lost everything, or uh, being surrounded by violence, being unable to find food, being unable to go to school for weeks, months, years on end, growing up in a childhood where uh, everything you're exposed to has some tinge of war and you know that adulthood cannot be normal after a childhood like that. I think it comes down to storytelling and characters and making a connection between us as Canadians and people who are out there who aren't all that different from us. And Anne-Marie, you've had a lot of experience in the Middle East and you continue to bring that to the current and with stories like Syria, and we're all faced with this now, there's a sort of, there's a, a, a fatigue with, with what's going on in Syria. Oh, another story from Syria, and yet people's lives every day at risk. How do you make, how would you get people, your listeners, your viewers, to connect with those people? Well, you know, I actually don't believe that people don't connect. So I don't begin with, nobody cares, what do I have to do to leap through the thing? Um, I actually go, and we see this, people do care. When you get the news, people actually can make the connection quicker than we journalists can sometimes. So yes, you want to make it human, but it is human, right? And so, and every story has a heartbeat. The bombardment of Syria matters because people are, are getting hit, they're dying, their kids are hurting. And there are ways, like on the current, just the, yeah, the other day we had an 11-year-old boy in homes. We managed to find somebody with a tape recorder who sent us the tape in radio. We didn't even have to go, we could still get access to him. And then we talked about the wider thing. But I do think that the idea that, the assumption that sometimes people assigning stories have that nobody will care about that is wrong. I think people do care about it, and then we have the obligation to, as David says, find the stories to really illustrate what it means to those on the ground. But I think if you look at how people react to the story of, of uh, natural disaster and to the story of war, they actually, in most individuals, have great empathy, and they want us to bring them those stories. It's not the hurdle. It has to be. And John, for you, I, it's being local, you have the advantage that people are connecting with the story. They, but how do you get, I mean, this, the, the coverage you've done on, on Rob Ford, which is just, I mean, it's a given, right? The whole world is watching that. But how do you get beyond that to try and connect with the larger story, what's going on there, that people maybe are missing? I think that's a very unique story, one that, you know, thankfully is quite uh, rare. We don't see that kind of thing too often. Uh, I mean, I think I'm very fortunate, uh, especially compared to my colleagues here who uh, may have a tougher time um, relating what's happening in, a, happening in a country far away. I mean, uh, I think a lot of us uh, tend to be, we care a lot more about our, our taxes, uh, what's happening in our neighborhoods. Uh, when you drive home and you see, you know, fire trucks or police cars, yellow tape, whatever. So for me, it's... Uh, Certainly it's storytelling, but uh, in my role here as an investigative journalist now, my role is to uh, break news, uh, and obviously news isn't what institutions want to tell you, uh, whether it's police services, governments, politicians, it's more uh, what they don't want to tell you. And that is the biggest challenge I face, is uh, digging, uh, getting people to come forward, whistleblowers, people who uh, will come forward and, and be courageous themselves enough to say, okay, I'll blow the lid off this thing. Uh, gaining trust with people uh, here in the community. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, like I say, I see these people in the supermarket or on, on the subway, whatever, and I've always found if you uh, cross a source that you've developed, you're done. So you've got to maintain these, these sources, you've got to develop them, and you've got to establish that trust that no matter what happens, if things go sideways, uh, you'll be the face of it, not them. Can I just uh, jump in for a second? I think, I think we all have an appreciation that what you do, I think, is actually, you know, the big secret is that it's way harder. Um, 
this is a really weird country to work in. I mean, I think Canada counts for me as one of the strangest countries I've ever worked in. We're, we're a weird group of people. You know, we don't really like to share all that much. It is easier, right, to ask for money on the street than to ask for an opinion in, in Canada. People are very closed about how they genuinely feel, very closed about how they vote. This isn't a whistleblowing culture in this country. So in order to cultivate a source in this country, and, and to follow through with an actual story that delivers is brutally difficult. We sometimes go all thunder boots into you know, a country somewhere around the world where, where people are so anxious to see us and so desperate to actually get the truth out and, and they see us as a very useful vehicle to expose something that's wrong. That it, sometimes the, the further away you go, the easier it is to get to the bottom of the truth. So, you know, make no mistake, trying to break something in Canada is brutally difficult. David, are you trying to jump in there? Or you just... I think yeah. she's put it lovely. I mean, I, you see it in television coverage where you interview one person and there's 30 others around them because they want to talk. They run at that camera. Same thing happens in the United States where people will talk about anything. You stand on a street corner, people will run through traffic and say, hey, what are you talking about? Uh, nuclear physics. Yeah, I could talk about that, right? <laughs> Just, no, to stay on Canada for a moment, because you all have experience there as well. Um, and because we're talking about free expression and all the things that these people we're going to honor tonight face every day in trying to tell the story, all the censorship, we have a situation here in Canada where our prime minister, as you know, will have people removed from airplanes for asking an unauthorized question. We have, you might not know this, but journalists, when they go, when they're covering things to do with Ottawa, they are kept as far away from the, the, the podium as possible to keep them from asking questions, from challenging the government. And you can actually lose your job, your livelihood, if you get tossed from the plane or you're excluded from the press gallery. So this just because Adrian's brought this up, how difficult it is, is not just in the point of view of how reserved Canadians are. We are facing huge challenges to free expression here. In Canada, and I know that Anne-Marie is on the board of CJFE, if you want to speak to that. Well, uh, we, in fact, the CJFE helps with lawsuits against reporters, uh, the chill of a legal suit, and it doesn't hit you as the reporter, it hits your bosses who uh, ask you 15 other questions and hold the story for five extra days because of the threat that if you put it out. And it's not just about getting the facts, it's about you're going somewhere where somebody doesn't want you to go. Remember, the CJFE has a Tara Singh Heyer award. Tara Singh Heyer was killed in BC. He, you know, he the editor of a, of a newspaper who was covering Air India. Uh, don't forget that a reporter in Quebec was shot for covering Hell's Angels, uh, you know, and as you point out, they can, they don't have to shoot you, they can do something to your house to let you know that they don't like it. But there's also, there is also the official chill that can be used and that, what that means is that it becomes, and also other reporters, sometimes when you question the status quo, I'm not saying you have to be courageous in the sense that we're talking again today, because I agree, we're not talking courageous, but talking about doing your jobs. Sometimes when you ask a question that, que the, that, that actually questions the status quo, the first people to jump on you will be other journalists. And uh, that becomes a distance. problem. To put distance between you and them, right? Yeah. Right. So the, the point is to keep asking when you're onto something. And we, we've seen this actually in the story you've been covering, uh, in the Rob Ford story. Not everybody was, uh, you know, there was a lot of criticism of people who were going after the Rob Ford story. And, and just to point out, John is, as he points out, a dog with a bone um, when he's going after a story. And But it's also that you have to and you know, sensitive to our bosses who are here, you have to convince them to let you take these chances to go out. And the CBC, you know, we're always very conscious of, you know, what's going to happen budget time, you know, but we have to have the courage to be able to continue that. If, if you dare, do you want to speak to that point? I've been very lucky. Uh, I've had a lot of support uh, given time and resources to, to do these things. Um, I think one of the most challenging ones we did recently had nothing to do with Rob Ford, but it had to do with uh, other alleged malfeasance, uh, if I can call it that, at City Hall involving uh, fundraisers, um, all sorts of strange things going on involving city councillors. And those ones uh, were, were a lot of fun to work on, but again, 
it's a wall of silence. It's almost, again, you're going up against uh, an institution, a political institution. And while there are some people who uh, sit back and hope you get break that story, the last thing they want to do, in my opinion, is be part of it. So that's always a, a bit of a challenge um, in that, again, in these institutions, people don't want to lose their jobs and their perks. They have a lot of power, uh, they have influence, and when you challenge them on that, uh, and a lot, not enough people do, I don't think. And I, I'm not saying we're better than anyone else, but I'm just saying it's a lot easier to cover the news than break the news. I just want to um, bring in, we have, as you see, two empty chairs there. They're not going to be empty for long because uh, we're, as we talk about this, all the people here know uh, we have a very, very important partner in the field, and that's the camera operator if you're doing television, and uh, they take enormous chances. And I want you to meet two of the finest that CBC has. They're, I'll, I'll introduce both of them and then they'll come up together. Mike Sweeney is just not only just the, the greatest guy who has watched people's backs all over the world. He's been in the Middle East, he's covered the war in Lebanon, he's covered Belfast, the Balkans, street fighting in Haiti. South Africa, the list goes on. He's now a videographer with CBC's doc unit. Osama Farig has covered the revolution in Egypt, earthquake in Haiti, Rwanda, Kandahar, South Africa, and much, much more. And he is now a videographer for The National. Please, please, please welcome our favorite people, Mike Sweeney and Osama Farag. Thank you. You have to know these guys hate this. They don't want to be on this side of things. This is not their comfort zone. They That's both begged me, begged me not to ask them a single question. And Mike Sweeney threatened to push the fire alarm earlier just to end this thing. <laughs> that's how, that's the length they'll go to avoid ever having to be exposed. But you should know how much we rely on these guys. Um, I just, uh, I want to ask both of you something that we encounter a great deal at Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, which is that, um, most of the people who end up being casualties in this business in the foreign field are camera operators, either video or still photography. They take enormous risks. Can you just both talk about how, why it is you, you are so in danger and how close you have to get to the action? Mike. Uh, well, uh, the, I, I think over the years, I, I started uh, uh, quite a while ago, uh, and over the years, I think things have changed. And when I, when I was uh, covering Lebanon, for instance, uh, which was a, an all-out civil war, not not civil disobedience, but you know, a, a a really violent war with rockets and mortars and so on. Uh, it's very very kind of impersonal, uh, and uh, you you know, you people get 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 killed certainly in those situations accidentally. Uh, uh, they're in places that are very dangerous. Uh, I feel though nowadays things have changed and uh, people are becoming targets. Uh, there's there's a uh, uh, you know uh, 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 like a, a, a policy of kidnapping of, uh, of uh, in you know in the days of Sarajevo snipers sniping at at uh, at uh, journalists and civilians alike and but but your camera uh, somebody mentioned sometimes your camera was your ticket into places uh, nowadays that camera is the is a uh, can be a death certificate uh, uh, if you're if you uh, find yourself in a in a situation where uh, you're exposing yourself one has to be much more much more careful uh, than 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 25 years ago say um, so it's it's I think it's a very different game these days uh, and and very very serious. Uh, I know th through, for instance, in in Lebanon, um, uh, Terry, t <coughs> excuse me, Terry Waite was kidnapped, and that that policy of kidnapping has really developed into a into a, a big business for uh, for uh, certain combatants. Sama, I know you, you're, ne you, you're now in that next generation and facing this, this kind of thing. You've come really close a few times. You want to tell us what happens to the camera operators? Um, just uh, to begin with, as you said, um, we are in the middle of it. 
And that's what makes us the target. We can be, but we can sometimes be in the balcony and shooting from, for, from a distance. But most of the time, you're going to be in the middle of the action to get the shots. With the big thing, big thing that big on your back, and you spot it all the time. The, the changes that I noticed from when I started till now is that they're after us for the money because they might sell the camera. That this happened to me in Somalia, and they would take it and sell it in Kenya. Uh, luckily, I, I wasn't shot, but I was able to get the camera back. Um, in Egypt, you're going into in the middle of Tahrir Square, and half of the people agree with what you say and the other half don't. And you're the cameraman, so the, you're showing the opinion of either side. So if your stuff goes through, the other side won't like it. So again, you become the target. So they'll snatch it from you if they don't like you, right? And you get all the beatings and stuff, you gotta run away. Um, but now what, what changed too is some of the states, the, the governments are after the cameraman. And they will blow up an office, for example, that, that they don't like the opinion that's coming up from that uh, network. Or, or in other governments, they will be targeting all the press, right? And shooting them down and sniping them down because they don't want the pictures out. Or in, like in Egypt, uh, they had, uh, on the first revolution, they had thugs around our hotel where we were staying. They were monitoring us all the time and shouting at us when we come out to the, at the balconies. They had those laser lights. And once one of us comes out, all the laser lights will come on us. And they'll shout and say, come down, we're waiting for you. And they surrounded our area so we can't access Tahrir Square. And we had to do all types of stuff to, to be able to get the cameras in Tahrir Square, like hide the cameras, use smaller cameras, uh, run around. Like uh, I'm almost, the way I look, I look uh, very close to the people there. So I'm, I'm originally Egyptian, uh, my dual nationality. So. I could mix very well, I speak the language, right? So I use these tools as a weapon to get in and try to come out with, ma with the material. Um, sometimes you don't, sometimes you go into big shouting and big screaming, but you're, you're always the target whenever you show something on your shoulder. So. Um, just one question I want to ask you both, because also what we deal with uh, with CJFE um, is the high levels of post-traumatic stress disorder among camera operators. It may be because your eye is looking right into tragedy and pain so much of the time, but really high levels of that. We've seen even documentaries have been made about that. Why is that the case, do you think? Um, well, I, I've, I've certainly seen uh, that in um, a couple of friends who had some very uh, uh, traumatic experiences, uh, one who lost a reporter uh, who was killed in Lebanon. And, uh, um, but as, as a photographer, uh, as a, a photojournalist, um, often we're, we're, we're kind of, kind of uh, numb to what we're seeing in front of us. Now, there are, obviously, there are some, uh, some dramatic exceptions to that, uh, but uh, you know, when I'm looking through the camera, uh, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, uh, separated from, from what's going on. But, but at the same time, I've got to be aware of that. I've got to make sure I understand where I am and what I'm doing and uh, uh, you know, what's going on around me. Uh, so it, it's, it, 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 uh, it can be a, a, you know, a very difficult thing at times. Um, but when, when really uh, dramatic things happen to you personally, uh, then I think that, that the idea of uh, uh, st uh, that stress disorder becomes very real to, to you. Uh, if it's happening to somebody else, uh, a stranger, uh, um, you might feel a little bit different. On the other hand, you, t you see a child uh, attacked and you're going to react differently. So you're, you're, there's, there's a, it's a very, very complicated. And, and everyone's n nodding knowingly because they've all seen the thing that really does trigger the most despair in uh, this business is when you see children under attack. And just Osama, just uh, how do you protect yourself? How do you protect your, yourself emotionally from what you're seeing? I just jump in <laughs> and start shooting. Um, I totally isolate myself. Like Mike Sweeney said, that he couldn't, I couldn't see it any better. You're into the field. The minute you step in, 
you really forget about everything else. You're getting the shots, you need to get this shot, that shot. Uh, the viewfinder is black and white, thank God this hasn't changed yet. So you don't see the real colors, but I can't watch some of the stuff that I shoot, like in Haiti with all the dead corpses and stuff. I can't watch that in color, but I was able to shoot everything behind the viewfinder. It just isolates you. But I also deal with it by getting so involved in it that I can't, like, I, I can't think. And if I get approach, approached by someone to ask for my opinion, I usually point to these guys. So I can't share my opinion with anyone because it, first it'll get me in trouble and it will, it will make me more personal, it'll make me think about the situation. But I would rather just get all the shots I can. And then the second thing I do is when I go home, back home to Canada, I meet my family and then I just don't stop talking. And that way I deal with, the, with my situation. So my poor wife there, she has to take all of this pressure. I, I, I feel she's more courageous than me. She sends me everywhere. So... Uh, the wife, please stand. Look at her, she's... Talk about people who won't... There you go. That's, there's the heroes. So, you um, also... just want to add one more point. Yeah. You also know that CBC is going to protect you somehow or another. And, and they deal with, with any of these problems. If you come back and talk about it, if you ever go through something that you don't like or you, you want to talk about, this is a huge place where they can help you with. We don't. We try not to. <laughs> but... It's always available, it's always open. And just on that, because we, we're, we're going to turn to audience questions while you're gathering your thoughts on that. I just want to ask Anna Maria, uh, because she is on the board of, of CJFE, and Adrian is hosting our event this evening as well, that this idea of going home, which you can do, and you can't if you're in the field. If you, Anna Maria, can you just tell people about the people who are winning the awards tonight? I, I think that's a really important point. Um, uh, tonight, Mebratu Teclision Bere will be there from Eritrea. Um, and like so many other journalists that the CGFE has honored for courageous reporting, we're talking about people who uh, they are doing, can I say, kick ass stories in their own backyard where they do not have a rule of law, where they cannot get into discussions with other journalists about whether you should do this or not, where literally there can be a knock on the door or uh, just the door will be opened in the middle of the night and people will be taken away. There is no way out. They may not even have passports. They certainly don't have the money to get out, even if they could. And the, 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 the layers of protection we have and, and of course, Western journalists, Canadian journalists, yes, put themselves at risk and bad things can happen. But the layers of protection that we have are gone. They're stripped away for the three journalists from Eritrea, the journalists from Turkey, to who, you know, who we are honoring tonight. And, you know, the CGFE throughout the year gets these requests to help as journalists try to sneak out of the country or try to help um, with the wounds that they've got. They can't even get the hospitalization payments. But the actual coverage, the, the, the courage it takes to go after people who can order up a hit on you as you wait for a red light, as you go to the grocery store, it, it's just mind-numbing. And, um, you know, I don't know how many of you are going to be there tonight, but CGFE, it's, uh, I'm going to give a plug because I do sit on the board. It's a really inspiring night to look at what's being done around the world and talk about a connection because we all want the same thing. We all want the truth to come out and we all want the people who are, um, who are suffering, we want their stories to be told. And when you Mabratu tonight, that's what the story is about from Mabratu as well. That'll be live streamed as well. This is, this is being live streamed, but we'll live stream CGFE this evening. And uh, just to, on that, that just re reminds me of what Mike Sweeney just said. One of the people we have uh, helped at CJFE, a cameraman, they aimed for his hand. They, he was shooting in the Middle East. Uh, he, was in the, he was a Palestinian cameraman. They shot his hand off. And we paid for the microsurgery to put his hand back together so he could continue doing his work. They know what they're doing for these people. At any event, we've got questions here, I think, and we can just be concise, please, with your questions. No speeches, and we'll get these people to answer for you. I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions, join us over here. We're going to start with a journalism student from here in Toronto. Hi. My name is Tamara Tika. I'm a fourth-year journalism student uh, in the joint program between U of T and Centennial College. And my question is for Carol Loff, Anna Maria Tremonti, and Adrian Arsenault. As women, um, are the risks especially high for you when you're reporting abroad? 
it's funny, as soon as you said as women, that first thing I flashed to is, it's the bathroom question, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Which is a great big deal for us when you're reporting in a desert and you look around and there isn't a tree in sight to hide behind. Um, that's when you know, that's when you find out who your friends are. You know? <laughs> look away. Um, you know, it's, it's a hazard sometimes, sure, but it's also a passport because I know we have all had different but parallel experiences where um, women w will talk with us and they will not, they're not able to talk with the men. And to walk into a place and to see women pull back the veil and sit down and sometimes, I've had it happen, they just hang on to your hand and just tell you what they've got to say. It's an amazing passport sometimes. It's also, I mean, it helps being short. I know this is ridiculous, but you know, I've been in places where being five foot three, um, and generous, thanks David, um, has actually been beneficial because people have seen a, you know, a small Western blondish woman and made the assumption, well, she's clearly not particularly bright. Let's not worry about her. Um, and so it has enabled me sometimes to push them and say, I, can you just help me understand this? Push them in ways that if, if it was a big guy asking them questions, they might instinctively get more aggressive. So I've been in funny situations where there have been a whole bunch of male reporters and they've sort of shoved me to the front of the line and said, you ask, you go, they'll tell you. So I don't see it as a problem, except for the bathroom situation, really. <laughs> situation but um, uh, you know in the grand scheme of things it's not something I think about you are looking at um, oh, Adrian's a little younger but you're looking at the first generation of women um, to be in large numbers on the air out of war zones on the air in print in radio in television Sarajevo a lot of women covered the war in Bosnia. Carol off in the field in, in the, the Balkans, in Afghanistan. This generation of women that gets older and stays on air, it's over. That question about whether women and men can do it. I mean, there are, there are always going to be variations. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, what do we look like as we go into this hostile territory? Are they going to see us as Western? Are they going to see us as whatever? So all of those questions can be legit. But the idea that women can't do it, it's over. The generation that, that took over so that men and women could report equally continues to work. Do not be intimidated by the gender question. I can't add anything to that, so thank you so much for your question. I just, wanted, I just also wanted to ask, so after experiencing all the risks um, for, for all of you on the panel, why do you continue going back? Is there an adrenaline rush, or what, what is it that drives you? I'll just get David to answer quickly that, because we've got people behind you that want to ask questions. Maybe just a quick answer from David. Severe illness. That's, uh, um, it's, uh, it's an adventure, and it's an adrenaline rush. And you're meeting people who you never thought you would have the opportunity to encounter. Uh, I like telling stories, and I like traveling and someone's willing to pay me and uh, most of my expenses to go and do it within reasonable grounds. So um, it's, uh, it's a thrill and an honor as well. These are important things to tell. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, next. Hello, my name is Graham. Um, I was just wondering, touching on what you were saying before, what kind of toll does it take on you when you see something horrific and it feels like all you can do is report it? not jump in and help out. Pretty hard to me. <laughs> it's, uh, you see stuff that perhaps you don't want to see, uh, deceased people, uh, bullet holes uh, in people, uh, you know, even as a GA reporter, you know, horrific things that happen on highways or fires. Um, but it's almost, not to sound, uh, you're there, but you don't live it. I remember asking once, uh, I was taking a, an English literature course at university, and I, we were reading a lot of depressing literature, and I said to the professor, like, my God, I feel awful, like, I was reading this stuff. Like, how do you, you teach this every day? Like, and he uh, said to me, you don't have to live it, but you can understand it. And I think what Usama was saying, uh, almost to protect yourself, you kind of don't think about 
what you're seeing necessarily. You're, you're there for a job. You're not there to uh, patch people up. That's the job of you know, army medics or paramedics, whatever. We're there as observers, and we're not supposed to be part of the story as observers, and I think that's how we kind of justify the way we feel. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get uh, both Mike and Osama to respond to that, because I think there are times when you do jump in, when you have to do something. And Michael, if you wanna speak to Yeah, I, I agree with that, that uh, uh, it, it depends on the circumstances, and certainly uh, if you're, if you're in a uh, if you're in a a, a large scale um, confrontation of some sort, there are lots of people around dealing with those issues. But if you're one or two people or three people alone and something happens, you you might change your mind about how you how you deal with that. You, you think about these things uh, in based on the circumstances you're in. So uh, you know there there have been. There have been times when, uh, I hope nobody gets mad at me for this, but I turned off the camera uh, and put it down when something, uh, something outrageous happens and uh, uh, something that, you know, that you, you, you really don't want to allow this person to, to, um, to, to be disrespectful to the dead to, you know, a situation, the situation that I was in was somebody was, an old man was being disrespectful to a dead soldier, and uh, I, uh, I just stopped and made him stop. And so you, you, you don't, you, you're not completely separate from everything. And, and as we were talking about before, the post-traumatic stress disorder, you're not, you're not totally separate from everything, and you can't be. Uh, uh, although ultimately you've got a job to do, and uh, when the circumstances are are uh, are favorable, you do that job and uh, bring back uh, the story that's as clearly illustrated as possible. Very difficult to illustrate things, you know. TV is TV is not real. It's an illustration of what happened, like a still photograph, or you know, it's one one point of view, one angle. Uh, it, you, you really, you really want to uh, try as hard as you can to focus on your job, but there can be circumstances where you might, um, you know, change your approach to how you're dealing with things. Osama, um, um, I would lock off the camera, keep it rolling, and go help them out if I have to. But to a certain extent, we actually help in other ways. And uh, like, if, if you want to touch up on this one, um, in Haiti, there was um, a family member who couldn't get in touch with her mom and wanted to bring her over uh, or take her out to, to Canada, I believe. And the only way she was able to do that is through us. So we do help. Right? The, I have a big conviction that my help is not immediate help, unless someone is dying and I'll just put the camera rolling and try to help him out. But I look at the bigger picture we have a much bigger role, and I concentrate on that more than, uh, I don't know if that helps you out. But <laughs> Thank you very much, a very good question. We have time for one more question. I hope it's uh, one that maybe everyone can respond to. It would be great to have a wrap up for us. Sure thing, I have a, my name is Mark. I just relocated here from Montreal. I'm working with the CBC Sports. Um, with the holidays coming up, this is a little lighter question, I guess. What? Um, what do you guys do to sort of sustain family obligations when you're in a foreign country, a war-torn country, and you simply can't get away, you can't get home for the holidays? How do you manage that sort of family aspect as well as your, your career obligations? The question is about what do you do when you're not, when you're abroad and you have to... Uh, you just can't get you, home. You can't get home. David. <laughs> Divorce, Divorce was the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have, I've been um, on assignment over... Christmas over New Year's, and um, it's not great, to, to be totally frank. It's lonely. There are, I've been out with Canadian soldiers, for instance, and something happens, but it's lonely for them. It's lonely for us. Uh, you do what you can, but it just becomes another work day, and you push through and look forward to the day that you will get back on a plane. Before Anna Maria answers, I want to tell you about one of the most emotional moments I remember in television was Anna Maria, I'm tearing up just remembering this, Anna Maria in an operating room uh, in, in Sarajevo, in the basement, in the dark, during a bombing scene at Christmas, and they're doing an operation by candlelight. 
And that's, I remember watching this at Christmas, and Maria, that was a happy time. Oh, yeah, well, we had a flashlight. We gave them the flashlight so they could finish the operation. Um, actually, the other correspondent uh, with the ABC Australia held it for them. But, uh, you know, um, you can, as a journalist, say no to assignments, and journalists do at times, or they check with their partners. Um, the other thing that we have now that we did not have even in the 90s is communication. I went into Bosnia with a big honking satellite phone. It took up the size of two giant suitcases, and I actually let people come and use it and call home. And the CBC finally said to me, you know that costs $10 a minute. And I said, Reuters is charging 40. I know. But, uh, but it was an honor system and people paid back. But the point is that sometimes, uh, like even if, um, now you can Skype, now you can, you can actually be in contact at home. And for me, when I was traveling, uh, we moved Christmas around. Um, and you know, sometimes you're with people, I remember being in Moscow at the fall of communism and all sorts of Russian friends of journalists who I was meeting because I wasn't living there, um, you, the, the, you, you end up part of, reporting is to understand the wider uh, life that people live and nothing is better than being around them at their holidays and you celebrate with them. As we go to John, um, you can't leave, you have to be there. You're actually seeing, can you let the story go at times even for holidays? Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I have a very su supportive partner who uh, understands. Um, again, though, I don't face nearly the travel regimen that all my colleagues do. Um, you know, uh, so it hasn't really affected me that way. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you miss kids' events. You miss your daughter's uh, school plays sometimes. And, you know, you, you get hecked for that when you get home. But uh, I think overall it's, it's, it's part of the deal. And uh, as long as you're there... Most of the time, you're okay. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I think a lot of us like to say, or maybe this is me and my other personalities like to say this, um, better at my job than my life. Um, I, think that, I think that happens sometimes. And you, but ultimately, you, know, you, sur if you have to surround yourself with people who get you, um, and that matters a lot. As Anna Marie said, you move Christmas around all the time. Um, some of the best Christmases I've ever had have been on the road. I mean... You know, the cameraman, we, you know, we love these guys. And when you're on the road together in some crazy place, go to the end of the world and turn left, and that's where you are, um, you know, you can have sort of great times together. I, I don't regret, and again, I really hope my mom's not listening, I don't regret any Christmas that I haven't been home in the sense that I, you still find a way to connect with the people you love, but you also have these moments you know, that matter with people you love in a completely different way. Your colleagues your he says your colleagues become your family. Yeah. I was living in Jerusalem and I had a, a, a bunch of friends come over for Christmas and all stay with me. And it was a great big party. And the next morning there was this horrific earthquake in Iran and I had to go. And so I left my keys and I said, I'm sorry about the turkey and the tree. And, help yourselves and can you lock up and I'll make it up to you next year. So the next year I said, this couldn't happen again. So invited the same group of people over and we had an even bigger party and on Boxing Day there was the Asian tsunami and I said, here are the keys and the tree and the turkey and next year and they said, yeah, no. Uh, so. in, uh, in 1982, a program called The Journal started and uh, the very first assignment uh, had me in uh, Vietnam and Cambodia for Christmas and New Year, and I've never done it again. <laughs> Once, that's it. <laughs> Still married. <laughs> well, I get very restless if I stay at home too long, so uh, I always look for uh, trips like this, and uh, especially on holidays, because I can always say, hey, I'm bringing some more money, it's overtime. So. <laughs> That's how I deal with it. Uh, but um, if, I, if I may just come back to that point where the um, gentleman asked about us helping in the field, because it, it does bother me a lot that when people are in front of you suffering and we can't really help, just a just point that if you try some, to help someone who's dying and he dies in your hands, you're responsible. And you get in so much trouble and your camera's gone 
and you're useless, basically. So, sorry, sorry to end with that note, but. I, well, I want to, we're going to end differently because I'm going to re reintroduce all of you again and we're going to end with a big round of applause. This is Osama Farig, Mike Sweeney, Adrian Arsenault, John Lancaster, Anna Maria Tremonti, David Common. These are fabulous people. They work hard for you. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. And uh, everyone, give all. a big round of applause for Carol Off. Thank you for leading this discussion today, Carol. All right, everyone. If you want to learn more about the stories that you heard about today or follow the work that these people do every single day, of course, go to cbc.ca. If you love CBC Radio, please join us here on Friday, December 6th for Sounds of the Season. It's our annual fundraiser that just takes over the whole building for Ontario food banks. You can see your favorite CBC Radio shows live, see a bunch of great musical performances. It's going to be a blast. And we're going to be back here next Wednesday. I'll have CBC News' Heather Hiscox and Reshmi Nair co-hosting with me. And we have a very special interview with George Strombolo. Follow us at CBC and we'll see you then. Big round of applause for them once more. Thank you.